the B.R. Ambedkar rightly said, a great man is different from an eminent one in that he is ready to be the servant of the society. A very good afternoon to one and all. I, Manmet Kaur, a student of School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, RV University, takes immense pride and pleasure to welcome you all to this great historical day where we will be witnessing and interacting with our chief guest, Mr. N. Gopalaswamy, former Chief Election Commissioner of India. A hearty welcome to our university, sir. I also take the privilege of welcoming Dr. Y.S.R. Murthy, Vice Chancellor, RB University. I welcome the deans of all the schools of RB University and Registrar. I welcome all the teaching and non-teaching fraternity of RB University. Last but not the least, I welcome the heart of the RB University, my dear fellow friends and students. No other than our beloved Vice Chancellor, Dr. Y.S.R. Murthy, would be apt to personify and enlighten us about an inspirational life journey of our distinguished chief guest, Mr. N. Gopalaswamy. So I request Dr. Y.S.R. Murthy to please deliver his opening remarks. Honorable Chief Guest, uh, Mr. Gopala Swami, my colleagues and students. Today we are privileged and honored to host an extraordinary human being. I have had a privilege of working with him in the National Human Rights Commission for several years. And during that time, I had an opportunity to closely see his uh, clinical precision on files. He, um, his file notings used to be uh, really, a truly a delight to read and he expresses himself with such clarity and uh, uh, such a uh, progressive person. And um, I've seen his reports, um, be it uh, in the wake of super cyclone which hit Varissa coast, or starvation that's in Varissa, and many other reports where um, the, he did an uh, on-the-spot uh, fact-finding for the commission. And then after he moved to the Union Home Ministry, and I had a chance to um, meet him there also. As you know, Home Ministry is a very, very important ministry which handles uh, center states uh, uh, and also um, uh, Union territories, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, disaster management, and uh, many uh, host of issues. Uh, uh, as a Union Home Secretary, uh, is a very tough uh, task indeed. Uh, you have to maintain law and order in the entire country, like you know um, the governor's appointments and many many issues. And um, I still remember him uh, and his invitation to me to join him as a staff officer in MHA. That I, I my daughter was very small, like I know, she was less than one year old. And the Home Ministry is uh, uh, used to working uh, from 6 p.m. onward till midnight and that was the uh, odd timings and then uh, I had to politely uh, uh, declare myself of that honour. And after his uh, joining election commission also I had an opportunity to interact with him. And um, in my former uh, uh, stint in the OP General Global University, I was directing the Centre for Human Rights Studies. And we undertook a study on uh, making uh, a right to vote a reality for every uh, citizen of the country. And then we examined the trends, etc. As a part of the study, I met him and uh, took his inputs for that report. And um, in this context, I want to inform you that uh, our uh, university has launched several research centers uh, and that include uh, the Center for Election Studies and Democracy in India and uh, being directed by the uh, Professor Vijayendra Kumar. And uh, so under the ages, uh, I'm so delighted that uh, Professor N. Gopalaswamy, uh, former Chief Election Commission of India, uh, has uh, delivering the inaugural lecture under the ages of this uh, 
new center and uh, Skopa Swami as a CEC handled many many uh, difficult issues there were um, there were other it's a multi-member body and you can imagine the um, stresses and strains of uh, and leading a multi-member body and that uh, India is a huge country with a oh, 1 billion plus population and with a myriad issues like you know affecting the elections and it's a uh, so he led it the uh, task very ably and thereafter you know I had an opportunity to appear before him as a part of uh, uh, he was heading a committee established by the Ministry of Human Resource Development to identify uh, 10 institutions of eminence in the public and then private sector and uh, so uh, he again uh, produced a wonderful report and then uh, uh, today uh, some of the institutions of eminence recognized by his committee are doing some extraordinary work both uh, you take up IIT Mumbai or IIT Chennai or even private institutions uh, his committee has created a, a kind of a, a catalytic effect which uh, uh, forced many uh, institutions to think about research, think about international rankings and think about uh, uh, academic excellence and aspire for uh, becoming an institution of eminence. And uh, sir, we are truly delighted to have you with us today and thank you very much for accepting and inviting with us. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your remarks. I am honored to introduce a brief about our chief guest, Mr. N. Gopalaswamy, a former Chief Election Commissioner of India, is a Padma Bhushan awardee, a gold medalist postgraduate in chemistry from Delhi University. Mr. Gopalaswamy joined the Indian Administrative Services in 1966 and served in the state of Gujarat for 25 years. In various positions, including in the departments of Education and Revenue, the Gujarat Electricity Board, and finally as MD of Gujarat Communications and Electronics before moving to Delhi to serve in the Government of India. While in the Government of India, he served in, served in the departments of Electronics in charge of Software Development Division, in the Planning Commission in charge of Education, Culture and Sports, in the National Human Rights Commission as its Secretary General, as Secretary in the Ministry of Culture and later as Union Home Secretary before being appointed as Election Commissioner in 2004 and later as Chief Election Commissioner in 2006. During its, his stewardship, the Election Commission successfully implemented many innovations, the most important of them being the introduction of photo electoral rolls to improve the quality and prevent impersonation and age cohort analysis of electoral rolls to improve their fidelity and accuracy. He is currently the president of Vivekananda Educational Society, which runs a group of 25 schools in and around Chennai. He is also currently the chancellor of the National Sanskrit. Be with you this afternoon, uh, more because of Dr. Murthy who's um, uh, with whom my association has been quite long since 1997-98 and I've seen his rise and I, uh, you know, I even today regret that he, he didn't join me in the home ministry. <coughs> we did, I mean, uh, the home secretary job as he, as he described is quite tough and he worked from 9 to 9 and still carry 5 home, okay. And uh, after the Kargil war, uh, the government decided that the Home Secretary, the Defence Secretary must be given additional help in terms of special needs to be looked at or special uh, areas to be focused and therefore each of these officers and each of the uh, secretaries got uh, two uh, uh, staff officers to look into, with whom they could interact to look into specific areas of work. Um, I had to manage one with, uh, with Murthy not uh, joining me and I wasn't too sure of many many other persons who could uh, who were well qualified to fill in that post. Anyway, um, 
the election management of the election area is a very, very vast area. First, let me ask a question. How many of you are registered electors, voters? Still, that leaves a lot of people, right? So, you are uh, either uh, skeptical about elections or democracy, or you are too lazy to go and register yourself. Which is, which is, which is the one which is true? <laughs> At your age, you can't be lazy, so you must be uh, still, uh, still skeptical about whether the election commission at all, uh, or the elections in the country at all will do any good. Anyway, um, you know, being a very vast city, I don't want to get into too many of these issues. So let me concentrate on only a few of them, and then leave this uh, floor open to questions, in which case, you know, uh, you're not confined to asking questions on the issues which I took. You are you're open to ask questions across the election scenario any, anywhere you like. <coughs> but let me confine myself to a few things. Uh, <coughs> first, let me give you a very brief idea of the uh, election scenario in the sense that everybody is aware we became uh, independent in 47, became a republic in 50. But the constitution when it came, it gave the franchise, it gave the power to vote to every individual in this country, without any qualification, which is way different from what many other countries did. In fact, there were suggestions that uh, it should be <coughs> confined to only the educated or the landed and etc. Et Previously, during the British period, there were elections, very limited uh, uh, people were, were allowed to vote. Either it was um, education uh, uh, oriented or it was landed gentry, etc. Unlike that, even as early as uh, 1930, the Congress Party had decided that when independent, when we achieve independence, it will be a, uh, the, the, the voting power will be rest with every individual. It will be universal adult franchise not restricted by education or by uh, wealth or whatever uh, the other parameters are there. Compare this with uh, many other countries. In the UK, which is the mother of all parliaments, women were given franchise only in 1920 after a much bigger struggle. There are other countries in Europe where even as late, it was it happened even as later in 1965. As compared to that, in India, franchise was given to everybody, right from the word go. Of course, it was it was criticized as uh, a mad exercise, and which will soon collapse. At least it has not collapsed. And over the last 70 odd years, time and time again, this country's population has proved that the faith which the constitution makers placed on it, in their ability to uh, to uh, grasp the essentials of election has remained intact, which is a great tribute to the constitution makers. But having said that, I will not um, hesitate to say whether the idea of a full-fledged democracy has really taken root in this country in an effective way. The reason why I say this, let me, let me therefore go on to the other, uh, briefly I'll mention uh, for the sake of your knowledge and information. The first two elections, 52 and 57, uh, the, there used to be a box for each candidate because many people would not be able to identify. So there was a symbol, a symbol and a box separate. 1962 it became one box. So you had the symbols on the paper, you had to mark it and then put it in the box. In 1977, 78, the then Chief Election Commissioner thought that the counting of votes is taking too long a time, the results are coming out much uh, later. So he decided that we should go for electronic voting. That was the beginning. Okay, and uh, my own experience, I'll tell you, I. The electronic voting had not actually come in uh, that election in 1995. And um, uh, I was the um, uh, observer for a constituency, parliamentary constituency in 
in uh, uh, East Kolkata district. We started counting at 8 a.m. and finished at about 2:30 in the morning next day. Okay. Today, you get it in hardly six hours time. You get the results. So that is the uh, power of the electronic uh, 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 counting machine and counter. So 77. Uh, he thought about it. By 79, the models were ready. One in Bangalore, VEL, the other ECL uh, in Hyderabad. And first elections were held with electronic voting in 1982 in Kerala in one constituency. Half the constituency went electronic, the other half the usual ballot paper. In 1984, on uh, a petition in, a court, in the court, in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court stopped it, saying that there is no specific provision for electronic voting in the law. It took another eight years before the specific provision could be made. And uh, during that period, the parliament, parliament had a subcommittee, which uh, a technical subcommittee, which went into the uh, design of the electronic voting machine and approved it. And thereafter, the, uh, the law was passed. But not until 1997, the required number of machines could be got and uh, uh, elections could be started with in a limited way. <clears throat> the first election, statewide election, with electronic voting machine was 2001 in Tamil Nadu, then 2002 in Punjab, then the entire country was went electronic in 2004. In 2014, uh, the Supreme Court uh, mandated that you should have a VVPAT, Voter Verifiable Paper Tray, machine attached to the uh, EVM in order to uh, uh, tell the voter as to whether his vote has been correctly recorded or no. So that is the evolution of the electronic voting machine. And the, uh, while the public has taken to electronic voting machine very well for two reasons. One, ease of voting. Two, you get the results very quickly. The political parties will uh, play a double game. If they win, the voting machine is fine. If they lose, the voting machine is bad. Okay, that's a simple, in simple terms. If I lose an election, the voting machine is to blame. If I win the election, even then they will not say the public has voted for me. <laughs> they will say that I won. Okay, anyway. Um, on the electronic voting machine, the first topic, on the electronic voting machine, I give you a history. But let me also tell you um, what when, when the Supreme Court decided in 2013 that there should be a VVPAT and at least some comparison should be made between the uh, votes as recorded in the VVPAT and as which comes out in the machine. Okay. This has been done uh, success, <coughs> successfully. Initially, the Election Commission uh, said only one voting machine per constituency will be used for this kind of match -made, matching of, uh, of the results. After that, the Supreme Court intervened and said at least five such um, polling stations should be taken per constituency. In the last election of 2019, 542 parliamentary constituencies went into poll. Average number of uh, assembly constituencies is about six per, um, per uh, parliamentary constituency and in each five polling stations have to be taken. In all, 20,652 polling station figures are matched and it is to the credit of the machines as well as the election commission that every one of them matched. So that the electronic voting machine is reliable with the uh, additional added facility of VVPAT is beyond doubt. But still, political parties being political parties, if they win, they won't question it. If they lose, they will blame the machine for having been manipulated. So that is the one issue which that whatever questions you will have on the electronic voting machine, we'll see later. If you look at the current scenario of, um, of the uh, Countries' parliament. I am not talking about the legislative assemblies. We also follow practically the same way. It is distressing to uh, find, and I am going to talk now about the criminals in the parliament or those criminally charged in the parliament. 
slowly the number of people with criminal uh, cases against the name has been creeping up. The last, uh, that is the 17th parliament, which is now current, 2019 elections, the number of people with criminal cases, number of MPs with criminal cases stands at 30 percent. Almost one in three of the, our MPs as a criminal case. Of course, being in politics, criminal case can mean, you know, that you went on a, a strike or you went on a um, uh, dharna, you went on a uh, agitation, etc. You might have been, uh, there might have been case five. Right. So let us not look at the uh, generality of cases. We look at only the specifics. The election commission defined as uh, heinous crimes, equity, murder, rape, etc. So now, what is the number of people in the parliament who have criminal cases of the heinous kind to their credit? Credit, President Vardakamma. Half of that. Fifteen percent of the of the uh, parliamentarians have serious heinous criminal cases against them. Now, look at the irony of the whole thing. The person who is charged with heinous criminal cases makes law for you. He is a breaker of law and he makes law for you. Can there be anything more uh, strange and, and um, I know, dichotomous than this? Okay. Then, I should draw uh, your attention to a small issue which to an extent mitigated, to an extent, not greatly, to an extent mitigated. This was a decision of the Supreme Court in a, in a case before it. Section 8.4 of the election law stipulates that if a person, if a sitting member of the Parliament of the Legislative Assembly is charged with a criminal case and is proved against him and he is given punishment, then the provision as it stood was that if he appeals within three months to a court of law, then the uh, judgment will be considered as suspended and he will not lose his seat. Now this was a provision which was challenged. And again, there is a story. I mean, how a remarkable uh, 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 person fought repeatedly against this provision. Um, 1996 or so, this lady, I forget her name, she's a, she's a lawyer from Delhi. She filed a case before the Supreme Court in 2002, it got dismissed. 2004 or 2005, she again filed a case with the Supreme Court on this issue. It again failed. And it was dismissed again. She filed a case again in 2009, it came to hearing in 2013, and the court accepted her contention that there are only two categories of people. One who is convicted, one who is not convicted. If he is convicted, irrespective of the appeal being, uh, being made, he or she must lose the post. That was the decision which the Supreme Court gave after she fought. She was all of 87 years when that happened. So thanks to such individuals who have the right attitude or the right and the patience to go through this entire legal system that we succeeded in ensuring. And what are the politicians go, uh, were doing at that time? Do you remember? Do you know that? I will tell you that also. You must understand what are what stuff our politicians are made of. Immediately, uh, a furor went up. All the political parties got together and wanted this particular judgment, the Supreme Court, to be to be annulled in the sense that they wanted to pass a legislation to do away with the effect of this uh, particular, uh, uh, you know decision of the courts. They had done it before, I will come to it later on. I mean, they had done one such thing before, that I will come to it later on. But, at the last minute, sense prevailed, and the proposal to make an amendment, further amendment to that particular provision, was dropped. So thanks to uh, uh, such munificence, we, we at least now 
slightly better off if somebody is convicted. But now they must be working over time to ensure that the court cases don't come for hearing at all. That must be their uh, game now. In 2003, Supreme Court, on a, on a petition by uh, Association for Democratic Reforms, made a, uh, made, made a uh, judgment, gave a judgment that with the uh, nomination paper, every uh, contestant must give two affidavits. One on his uh, criminal cases against him, the other one on the uh, on his uh, on his assets and liabilities. Those two statements. Mind you, what the what the uh, what the politicians decided to at that time was to pass a law that is not necessary at all. It is still on the statute book. Mind you, they pass a law to nullify the judgment of the Supreme Court. But when somebody went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court said, uh, said you may pass any law. But as long as our judgment reminds, that is the law. So, still, all these uh, worthy members file their, um, you know, uh, file the list of criminal cases as well as their assessment liabilities. But the unfortunate point, which is now coming to, the unfortunate point is, in 20 years, I have hardly seen any case in which the person who is criminally charged, who also says, um, to all the members of the public saying that, look at this list, I am charged with this uh, murder, this decoity, this robbery, etc. We still vote for him. Still vote for him. The number of uh, uh, people, I mean, the, 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 affidavit, the other affidavit was on the assets and liabilities. The last parliament, 2019, has 88% of people who own, whose assets are more than a crore. So, uh, one of the newspapers, when it published it, it said, Crorepati Parliament, 88% are Crorepatis. The accompanying point is that, unfortunately, it seems that our understanding of democracy is that the person with bags of money should win. Others should wait and watch and vote and wait for the next five years. That's an unfortunate point. Because when somebody has a criminal case, serious criminal cases, how is it that he or she repeatedly, mostly he, repeatedly gets voted to the office? Why is it happen? Where have we gone wrong? Is there a limit? These are the questions. Because why did the Supreme Court decide to have these affidavits? It decided only to educate the voter. But it seems that the voter is educated in the sense that he reads, but he doesn't react. Same thing you can say um, of, of uh, some of these ways on. When you have uh, people who resign from one party because they are not made ministers, stand for election in the other party, get elected and become members of the cabinet. Okay. So what is at the core? Is serving the people or serving self? Along with it, let me also say, now bring in the other issue of the political parties. In the constitution, right from the beginning, even though it was recognized that there will be political parties and each political party has a a symbol, the word political party is never defined, is not defined in the constitution until 1989. And that too not directly, indirectly only. In an amendment passed to prevent the flow crossing, there is a mention of political party. Until today there is no legislation, despite all recommendations, there is no legislation which can, which can lay down the uh, 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 you know uh, uh, do's and don'ts etc. for political. There is no legislation on political parties. All political parties are expected to only be with you this afternoon. Uh, more because of Dr. Murthy, who's um, uh, with whom my association has been quite long since 1997, 98. 
and I have seen his rise and I, uh, you know, I even today regret that he, he didn't join me in the Home Ministry. <coughs> we did, I mean, uh, the Home Secretary job as he, as he described is quite tough and he worked from 9 to 9 and still carry files home, okay. And uh, after the Kargil war, uh, the government decided that the Home Secretary, the Defence Secretary must be given additional help in terms of special needs to be looked at or special uh, areas to be focused and therefore each of these officers and each of the uh, secretaries got uh, two uh, uh, staff officers to look into with whom they could interact to look into specific areas of work. Um, I had to manage one with, uh, with Mufi not uh, joining me and I wasn't too sure of many, many other persons who could uh, who were well qualified to fill in that post. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the election management and the election area is a very, very vast area. First, let me ask a question. How many of you are registered electors, voters? Still, that leaves a lot of people, right? So, you are uh, either uh, skeptical about elections or democracy, or you are too lazy to go and register yourself, which is, which is, which is the one which is true. <laughs> At your age, you can't be lazy, so you must be uh, still, uh, still skeptical about whether the election commission at all, uh, all of the elections in this country at all will do any good. Anyway, um, you know, being a very vast area, I don't want to get into too many of these issues. So let me concentrate on only a few of them, and then leave this uh, floor open to questions. In which case, you know, uh, you're not confined to asking questions on the issues which I took. You are you're open to ask questions across the election scenario any, anywhere you like. <coughs> but let me confine myself to a few things. Uh, <coughs> first, let me give you a very brief idea of the uh, election scenario in the sense that everybody is aware we became uh, independent in 47, became a republic in 50. But the constitution when it came, it gave the franchise, it gave the power to vote to every individual in this country without any qualification, which is way different from what many other countries did. In fact, there were suggestions that uh, it should be <coughs> confined to only the educated or the landed and etc. Et Previously, during the British period, there were elections very limited uh, uh, people were, were allowed to vote. Either it was um, education uh, uh, oriented or it was landed gentry, etc. Unlike that, even as early as uh, 1930, the Congress Party had decided that when independent, when we achieve independence, it will be a, uh, the, the, the voting power will be rest with every individual. It will be universal adult franchise not restricted by education or by uh, wealth or whatever uh, the other parameters are there. Compare this with uh, many other countries. In the UK, which is the mother of all parliaments, women were given franchise only in 1920 after a much bigger struggle. There are other countries in Europe where even as late, it was it happened even as late as 1965. As compared to that, in India, franchise was given to everybody, right from the word go. Of course, it was, it was criticized as uh, a mad exercise, and which will soon collapse. At least it has not collapsed. And over the last 70 odd years, time and time again, this country's population has proved that the fate which the constitution makers placed on it in their ability to, uh, to uh, you know, grasp the essentials of election has remained intact, which is a great tribute to the constitution makers. But having said that, I will not um, hesitate to say whether the idea of a full-fledged democracy has really taken root in this country in an effective way. The reason why I say this, let me, let me therefore go on to the other, uh, briefly I'll mention uh, for the 
sake of your knowledge and information, the first two elections, 52 and 57, uh, the, there used to be a box for each candidate because many people would not be able to identify. So there was a symbol, a symbol and a box separate. 1962 it became one box. So you had the symbols on the paper, you had to mark it and then put it in the box. 1977-78, the then Chief Election Commissioner thought that the counting of votes is taking too long a time, the results are coming out much uh, later. So he decided that we should go for electronic voting, that was the beginning. Okay. And uh, my own experience, I'll tell you, I, the electronic voting had not actually come in uh, that election in 1995. And um, uh, I was the um, uh, observer for a constituency, parliamentary constituency in, in uh, East Kolkata district. We started counting at 8 a.m. and finished at about 2.30 in the morning next day. Okay. Today, you get it in hardly six hours time, you get the results. So that is the uh, power of the electronic uh, 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 counting machine and counting. So 77, uh, he thought about it. By 79, the models were ready, one in Bangalore, VEL the other ECL uh, in Hyderabad. And first elections were held with electronic voting in 1982 in Kerala in one constituency. Half the constituency went electronic, the other half the usual ballot paper. In 1984, on uh, a petition in, a court, in the court, in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court stopped it saying that there is no specific provision for electronic voting in the law. It took another eight years before the specific provision could be made and uh, during that period the parliament, parliament had a subcommittee, which, uh, a technical subcommittee which went into the uh, design of the electronic voting machine and approved it and thereafter the, uh, uh, the law was passed but not until 1997 the required number of machines could be got and uh, uh, elections could be started with in a limited way. <coughs> The first election, statewide election, with electronic voting machine was 2001 in Tamil Nadu, then 2002 in Punjab, then the entire country was went electronic in 2004. In 2014, uh, the Supreme Court uh, mandated that you should have a VDPAT, Voter Verifiable Paper Tray, machine attached to the uh, EVM in order to uh, uh, tell the voter as to whether his vote has been correctly recorded or no. So that is the evolution of the electronic voting machine. And the, uh, while the public has taken to electronic voting machine very well for two reasons. One, ease of voting. Two, you get the results very quickly. Okay. The political parties will uh, play a double game. If they win, the voting machine is fine. If they lose, the voting machine is bad. Okay, that's a simple, in simple terms. If I lose an election, the voting machine is to blame. If I win the election, even then they will not say the public has voted for me. <laughs> they will say that I won. Okay, anyway. Um, on the electronic voting machine, the first topic, on the electronic voting machine, I give you a history. But let me also tell you um, what when, when the Supreme Court decided in 2013 that there should be a VVPAT and at least some comparison should be made between the uh, votes as recorded in the VVPAT and as which comes out in the machine. Okay. This has been done uh, success, <coughs> successfully. Initially, the Election Commission uh, said only one voting machine per constituency will be used for this kind of matchmaking matching of, uh, of the results. After that, the Supreme Court intervened and said at least five such um, polling stations should be taken per constituency. In the last election of 2019, 542 parliamentary constituencies went into poll. Average number of uh, assembly constituencies is about six per, um, per uh, parliamentary constituency. And in each, five polling stations have to be taken. In all, 20,652 polling station figures are matched and 
it is to the credit of the machines as well as the election commission that every one of them matched. So that the electronic voting machine is reliable with the uh, additional added facility of VVPAT is beyond doubt. But still, political parties being political parties, if they win, they won't question it. If they lose, they will blame the machine for having been manipulated. So that is the one issue which that whatever questions you will have on the electronic voting machine, we'll see later. If you look at the current scenario of, um, of the uh, country's parliament, I am not talking about the legislative assemblies, they also follow practically the same way. It is distressing to uh, find, I am talking, I am going to talk now about the criminals in the parliament or those criminally charged in the parliament. Slowly, the number of people with criminal uh, cases against the name has been creeping up. The last, uh, that is the 17th parliament, which is now current, 2019 election, the number of people with criminal cases, number of MPs with criminal cases stands at 30%. Almost one in three of the, our MPs has a criminal case. Of course, being in politics, criminal case can mean, you know, that you went on a, a strike or you went on a um, uh, dharma, you went on a uh, agitation, etc. You might have been, uh, there might have been case five. So let us not look at the uh, generality of cases. We look at only the specifics. The election commission defined as uh, heinous crimes, equality, murder, rape, etc. So now, what is the number of people in the parliament who have criminal cases of the heinous kind to their credit? Credit, President Vardakamas. Half of them. 15% of the, of the uh, parliamentarians have serious, heinous criminal cases against their name. Now, look at the irony of the world. The person who is charged with in his criminal cases, makes law for you. He is a breaker of law and he makes law for you. Can there be anything more uh, strange and, and um, I know, dichotomous than this? Okay. Then, I should draw uh, your attention to a small issue which to an extent mitigated, to an extent, not greatly, to an extent mitigated. This was a decision of the Supreme Court in a, in a case before it. Section 8.4 of the election law stipulates that if a person, if a sitting member of the Parliament of the Legislative Assembly is charged with a criminal case and is proved against him and he is given a punishment, then the provision as it stood was that if he appeals within three months to a court of law, then the uh, judgment will be considered as suspended and he will not lose his seat. Now this was a provision which was challenged. And again, there is a story. How a remarkable uh, 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 person fought repeatedly against this provision. Um, 1996 or so, this lady, I forget her name, she is a, she is a lawyer from Delhi. She filed a case before the Supreme Court in 2002, it got dismissed. 2004 or 2005, she again filed a case with the Supreme Court on this issue. It again failed, and it was dismissed again. She filed a case again in 2009, it came to hearing in 2013, and the court accepted a contention that there are only two categories of people. One who is convicted, one who is not convicted. If he is convicted, irrespective of the appeal being, uh, being made, he or she must lose the post. That was the decision which the Supreme Court gave after she fought. She was all of 87 years when that happened. So thanks to such individuals, 
who have the right attitude or the right and the patience to go through this entire legal system that we succeeded in ensuring. And what are the politicians go, uh, were doing at that time? Do you remember? Do you know that? I will tell you that also. You must understand what are what stuff our politicians have made off. Immediately, uh, a furor went up. All the political parties got together and wanted this particular judgment of the Supreme Court to be to be annulled in the sense that they wanted to pass a legislation to do away with the effect of this uh, particular uh, uh, you know decision of the courts. They had done it before. I will come to it later on. I mean, they had done one such thing before that I will come to it later on. But at the last minute sense prevailed and the proposal to make an amendment, further amendment to that particular provision was dropped. So thanks to uh, uh, such munificence, we, we are at least now slightly better off. If somebody is convicted. But now they must be working overtime to ensure that the court cases don't come for hearing at all. That must be their uh, game now. And in 2003, Supreme Court, on a, on a petition by uh, Association for Democratic Reforms, made a, uh, made, made a uh, judgment, gave a judgment that with the uh, nomination paper, every uh, contestant must give two affidavits, one on his uh, uh, criminal cases against him, the other one on the uh, uh, on his uh, on his assets and liabilities. Those two statements. Mind you, what the what the uh, what the politicians decided through at that time was to pass a law that is not necessary at all. It is still on the statute book, mind you. They passed a law to nullify the judgment of the court. But when somebody went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court said, uh, said you may pass any law, but as long as our judgment reminds, that is the law. So, still, all these uh, worthy members file their, um, you know, uh, file the list of criminal cases as well as their assessment liabilities. But the unfortunate point, which is now coming to, the unfortunate point is, in 20 years, I have hardly seen any case in which the person who is criminally charged, who also says um, to all the members of the public, saying that, look at this list, I am charged with this uh, murder, this decoity, this robbery, etc. We still vote for him. Still vote for him. The number of uh, 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 people, I mean, the, 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 affidavit, the other affidavit was on the assets and liabilities. The last parliament, 2019, has 88% of people who own whose assets are more than a crore. So, uh, one of the newspapers, when it published it, it said, Crorepati parliament, 88% are Crorepatis. The accompanying point is that, unfortunately, it seems that our understanding of democracy is that the person with bags of money should win. Others should wait and watch and vote and wait for the next five years. That's an unfortunate point. Because when somebody has a criminal case, serious criminal cases, how is it that he or she repeatedly, mostly he, repeatedly gets voted to the office? Why is this happen? Where have we gone wrong? Is there legitimate? These are the questions. Because why did the Supreme Court decide to have these affidavits? It decided only to educate the voter. But it seems that the voter is educated in the sense that he reads, but he doesn't react. Same thing you can say I'm off of uh, some of these ways on. When you have uh, people who resign from one party because they are not made ministers stand for election in the other party, get elected and become members of uh, the cabinet. Okay. So what is at the core? Is serving the people or serving self? Along with it, let me also say, now bring in the other issue of the political parties. In the constitution, right from the beginning, even though 
it was recognized that there will be political parties and each political party has a lot of symbol. The word political party is never defined, is not defined in the constitution until 1989 and that too not directly, indirectly only. In an amendment passed to prevent the flow crossing, there is a mention of political party. Until today, there is no legislation, despite all recommendations, there is no legislation which can, which can lay down the uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, do's and don'ts, etc. for political. There is no legislation on political parties. All political parties are expected to only, the rest didn't contest at all. Not only that, many of them don't file the uh, required papers in time. But, then election commission is constrained because while election commission can register a political party, it does not have the power to deregister a political party. Despite asking for this powers since 1997, no uh, uh, government, no parliament has, uh, has uh, seen the requirements to ensure that those would not contest. And uh, from your own experience, in the 2008, we did a quick survey of uh, three or four political parties because we found year after year their, um, their uh, annual uh, you know, return showed only the same amount of money as having been donated to them, 20 lakhs of rupees. And uh, so we, we said, that, let's have a look at these political parties. So I sent people, uh, incognito to Noida. He found one in, uh, two in Noida, one in Gurgaon somewhere. Uh, one board, one chair, one uh, table and one telephone. All the money was in jewellery or in bank lockers or in uh, FDs. They had no intention of contesting. They are only looking at the opportunity to convert black money into whites. 20 lakhs of rupees. <coughs> You can say that 20 lakh people donated one, one rupee each and that's how we got the money. So this is another thing which unfortunately none of the political parties have been ready to have a legislation to uh, lay down the thing for political parties to Comes with this is the other issue of how the political parties are funded. There is absolutely no uh, you know, transparency in the political party funding, unfortunately. When the political parties are expected to report anything over 20 rupees, nobody gave any political party anything more than 20 rupees. When it has become 20,000 rupees, even today, nobody gives anything more than material. And then some experiments are made in order to uh, get some accountability, but unfortunately, the, legis uh, the uh, amendment to the law in 2010 or 2009, which created a trust. And the trusts were not trustworthy. So, uh, <laughs> And 2013 or 15 or so, when the uh, bond scheme came, no transparency at all. One can understand to an extent why there is a difficulty. Difficulty in the sense that no major industry or major uh, person, I mean, person who would like to contribute to a political party would have would want his name to be revealed at all because of the type of politics we have. Okay. If you are not my friend, you are my enemy. There is no third category of being a neutral person. So if you gave money, you are my friend. If you did not give money, even if you did not give to anybody else, you are my enemy. So that being the case, none of the, uh, none of the institutions, etc., etc., would like to openly say, that we have contributed. So that is a is a unfortunate end there that nothing is happening. Let me finally come to 
take a minute on the voting patterns in this country, which is again something which we should be concerned with. The uh, generally held view, which is largely true, is that the cities don't vote well, the rural areas vote well. Generally held. I found one exception. I believe in 2019 elections, the um, some of the constituencies in Bangalore voted better. Voted better. But let me let me let me give you the worst case scenario. You are all aware of 2008. Many of you may be aware of 2008 when there was an attack uh, in Bombay, and uh, immediately for the next few days, people. Very influential people, very very uh, well known people carried uh, for days together candlelight processions, being totally disgusted with what happened, and uh, you know, or you know, uh, protesting against Pakistan's uh, you know hand in this and all that stuff. Four months later, there was election in Maharashtra. Those areas where this, all these protests were there polled a miserable 22%. A miserable 22% was the polling. <laughs> so we're all good at carrying candlelights, but we don't light candles. Unfortunate that. But I'm told that in the last election in Bangalore slightly improved. Though still all the four constituencies in Bangalore vote less than the rural areas of Karnataka. Why is this? Well, there could be many excuses that you know, people are not registered, this and all. Finally, let me come conclude with the one point. The, uh, at least in terms of um, the electoral role and its fidelity, one issue which has been uh, uh, under request from the election commission to the government of India is to link Aadhaar which is likely to come through and with that slightly better control could be there on the registration, deregistration, etc. Having said this, I, I I think I <coughs> will stop there and uh, we need to make this a truly a better democracy. Barring one or two parties, in none of the political parties there is democracy. Very unfortunate. We call ourselves the biggest democracy, the largest democracy in the world. Every democracy has its own, uh, you know, uh, weak points. We are under that. Because, you know, we, uh, uh, in some ways, just take a minute. Some ways, what happens in some other countries is amazing. In Australia, you will not find even one single policeman around the polling station. And people in USA, people volunteer to become polling officials at a pittance. For two trainings and one day of full work, they will get paid hundred dollars, which is nothing at all. So it is a service to the community. I have seen in a place like uh, uh, Maldives, where I went for an election, practically all polling stations were managed by women. And there, the polling is done after half an hour gap of polling ending. Counting is also done in the polling station. They manage everything without any hassle. Can you think of anything in this country of that kind? If anybody suspects that his party is not going to win, the whole place will be set to fire along with the, uh, along with the material. But USA is also not uh, very... Uh, USA, the constituencies are managed on the daily mandarin. Every country has certain... Um, they don't have... USA, they don't have any limit on the spending while we have. We always violate. Then there is no limit on spending, but you have to account for every pie, every every cent of the money you collect. There is an election commission in uh, USA, 
but its job is not to conduct the election. Its job is to ensure that the money collected by every candidate is actually accounted for. He can spend billions of dollars, but he must account for them. So every country has uh, different uh, approaches to this, but we in India call ourselves the largest democracy. Still, we are very far away because our own political parties do not have uh, inner democracy in them. So the problems are many, and uh, the solutions are not immediately in sight. I mean, in the sense that it's easy to talk about solutions, but who has to implement them into the parliament? So I haven't still heard of a person who willingly chops off one leg. So that is what the things are now, but the floor is open to questions. Thank you. Open for question and answer session. Um, so, so, what is your thought on local uh, body elections? Like, we always talk about state uh, assembly and parliament, but isn't the true democracy at work at local body governments? You have a very important issue of that. Unfortunately, uh, political parties. Uh, notwithstanding democracy for the last 70 years, do not seem to be believing in democracy of the grassroots. It is a it is a very very um, uh, difficult dynamics, and I would uh, like your centre to study this. Your your centre, which is going to start, uh, is starting now, to study this. See every level of uh, decision making, whether parliament, assembly, and the local body. Each one is in a love-hate relationship with the other. The state will want all powers to come to it from the center. More powers to come. But they will not give any powers to the local bodies. Okay. Local bodies, they will complain, the states will complain saying that all our income sources are being dried up by the center. The last one being with ESG. Okay. But in turn, they will never authorize because, you see, the closer you are to the, to the site, to the happening, the more visible you are. So, the MLA is afraid that if there is a popular serpent, then his days are numbered. So, the MP is afraid that if there is a popular MLA, then his days are numbered. I mean, he can't, uh, he has got to depend upon this MLA for everything. Unfortunately, we also are part of this particular thing for wrong reason. We ask MLA saying that um, my road is, water is, uh, water pipes are leaking or the sewage pipe is not working. Now, that is the job of the uh, municipal corporate. So we don't discriminate. So he feels, uh, all right, now I will solve it. <laughs> he will go and personalize the Munsal Corporation. They will say that to help with you, we will not do this because you will get the credit and we don't want you to get the credit. So there is, there is this uh, unfortunate fight. But unless, unless the local bodies are strengthened, the problem solving will not take place easily. The local bodies must solve the local problems. And um, you know, in that context, I would like to float an idea with you, which you can think of and maybe discuss it later on. Now, um, you know, there is a talk saying that our parliament uh, size is very small. Uh, there will be uh, 543 plus 250, about 700 or So it should be increased to 1000 or all this stuff. I think it's a bad idea, in my view. Because, what is an MP expected to do? He is not to look at your sewage pipe, whether it is leaking or whether you are getting water. He is not to look at uh, what the state is doing in every constituency. That is the job of the MLA. He should look at the state as a whole and India as a whole. So he is expected to be part of a larger vision for the country. If you view in that context, 
It is immaterial whether he represents 5 lakh people or 10 lakh people. But unfortunately, our own understanding of things is so um, convoluted that we ask the M MP, saying that my uh, sewage pipe is not working, what are you doing about it? So what happens to the MP goes to Parliament, he keeps thinking about the sewerage leaking in uh, Jayanagar, and he doesn't attend to the discussion on the uh, education policy for this government, then you will have an education policy where there is more sewer than anything else. It's very unfortunate. But there is also the other side, when you ask them, they will give you a different story. I mean, I, I have conjured up a story for this. There is this foreign minister who, uh, uh, when he went back to the constituency to, uh, to get re-elected, they asked him, saying that, what did you do for, for us? He said, look, I have done a deal with Iran that for the next 50 years, you will get gasoline and petrol at a very, very cheap rate. Whether it goes up or goes down elsewhere, you will get it at this price. So therefore, our energy concerns are all now gone. I went to some other country and ensured that from Egypt that for the next 50 years, we will get cotton at a very low price. They will say, all right, you go and live in Egypt or in uh, Iran, you have no place here. You are next to them. What did you do for us? You are doing deal with Iran doesn't help me. That's what he will think. You are doing uh, deal with Egypt doesn't help me. My sewerage is leaking, my, uh, mm, uh, you know, uh, I am not getting uh, labor or I am not getting work. So what have you done for me? So, Invariably, this minister or somebody else starts looking at what he can do for this and in the process. If anybody cares to watch the Raj Sabha or the Lok Sabha TV on very important discussion going on, you will find hardly any member sitting there. And those who are sitting there may also be not very awake. <laughs> the reason is this. They know that it is not it's not, uh, uh, it's, not the, it's not the bread which is buttered for them, it's something else. So, given a chance, he will run down to uh, the minister, this ministry, that ministry, saying that, you know, in, in, uh, this, this is what is required in my, uh, in my area, whatever it is. It's not that I am, I'm, I'm not saying that he should not do that. But, unfortunately, we, uh, we are responsible for changing his priorities, but ultimately, he understands, as an as a intelligent politician, he understands what exactly he has got to do to get re-elected. So he's not going to concentrate on education policy or foreign policy. He's going to concentrate on sewerage uh, lines for you. So uh, we are also responsible for that. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Shanta from Sewerage. Uh, my one asks, like, we've observed how the youth in general these days are comparatively lesser involved or uh, invested in politics as such these days. And I want to ask with your experience that you've had in your journey, what do you think we could do to have a shift uh, in the way we think about um, politics as such? And what do the youth do about this? Like I mean, personally, like a lot of times I like knowing about stuff, I like being knowledgeable about it. But what can we do about it actively? What can we implement? The first thing you can do is to ensure that in your building, in your next building, and the adjoining two buildings, if you are in this building, this building, this building, everybody who is above 18 is in, in road. You can do that as a service. If you have a computer at home, you can access the, um, uh, access the internet, find out whether all people in that building, or all people at least in your building, are in road. If they are not enrolled, can you go and persuade them to get enrolled? And so on. This is one. Second is to, to at least look at the profile of the candidates and decide where you should vote. But the government, unfortunately, I, I, didn't get it, I didn't want to get into the other issues of um, voting uh, by caste, community, this, that, that. I didn't want to get into it. But the fact of the matter is that many uh, uh, many people who deserve to be recognized do not get recognized. One of the reasons for that is the political parties. Political party ran last election in Tamil Nadu, 
I was told that uh, when you went with your application for, elect, uh, for uh, being nominated by a party for their candidature, the first question asked is, how much money can you, can you spend? So the first question asked. And if he quoted the right figure, then they knew that he is capable of spending more. But right figure means he, he said something. So they said, how much can you spend for the next constituency? <laughs> so, so if that is the approach of the political party, because barring one or two, most political parties are family establishments. So at least try and even if the candidate you know is going to lose, my point is exercise your franchise in favor of the best candidates. Who you think is the best, for whatever the reason. So one day we need to break this uh, uh, vicious circle of voting for a political party only. Go away from that. The target must be the, the person who, represent, who is representing the party. If that fellow is good enough, is he good enough? If people start thinking in those lines and then start punishing the non-performers, things will change. As I mentioned to you, today there is no law governing political parties. Law. So what is happening is that there is a symbols order which was done in 1952 and improved upon 1968 or so. The symbols order says that a symbol will be allotted if 100 people can get together and become a uh, register a political party, you come to us, you will get a symbol order. So since there is no other uh, yardstick to go by, this is where it is. And the, the ele election commission can say no to registering only if the requirement is not there. If there are 99 people, you can say no. If there is a, a constitution written where there was one, I remember one uh, party who came in the constitution where the president uh, the, the person who was uh, the leading person was the president, his wife was the secretary, his son was the uh, joint secretary and so on and so forth. And um, it was a family concern masquerading as a political party. So the commission said no, it's not on. So only that minimal, uh, you know, uh, minimal correction can be made by the commission unless there is a law. So there has to be a comprehensive law for political parties. In fact, uh, Justice Vikita Chalaya, who, who, uh, who was the president, was the chairperson of uh, uh, the Constitution Review Committee 2002, had proposed, uh, in fact, he drafted um, uh, a law for the political parties. But, you know, inconvenient recommendations are never accepted. And uh, uh, we have a saying in, uh, uh, in the civil service, and do you form a committee? If you can't commit yourself, committee yourself will be so, Uh, first thing is EVM cannot be hacked because it is not connected to any any circuit. It's a standalone machine, and uh, you try and pass a signal, it cannot accept the signal because it's not a it doesn't receive any signals. It is actually a glorified calculator or less glorified calculator. Okay. 
you press it one, once, one button, it records one. You press it again, it says one plus one is equal to two. That's all that intelligence is printed. It doesn't have any great uh, intelligence built into it. Okay. Uh, I didn't go into the entire gamut of uh, tests which are done before EVMs are taken to the police station. Uh, there are uh, first level tests which even before the political part, uh, candidates are decided. Political parties are invited and every machine is tested. Uh, on 10% of, 5% uh, of machines actually polling is done and shown to the representative saying that it's recording properly. Then the next level test is when the machines are taken from the district headquarters to the constituency headquarters. At that time also again tests are made. Now by, by then the candidate is known. So candidates are called or their representatives. Uh, the tests are done in front of them. 10% um, of the machine, 1000 votes are polled. And the white 1000. Somewhere somebody started a rumor saying that the first 50 votes go to one candidate, all the rest of it is also go to him. <laughs> Whichever button you press. So, in order to meet that rumor, the commission said 1000 votes we poll you, uh, come, and, come and see. Okay. So, that is done. Then, on the day of poll, then the machines go to the uh, polling station. On the day of poll, again, there is a mock poll. Before the regular polling starts, then the mock poll again to the representatives, the polling representatives of the candidates, it's shown again. Mind you, the decision which machine will go from the main go down to the, the uh, constituency go down, from the constituency go down to the, to the polling station is decided not by any person. It's decided through a computer program. Number one. Number two. Which official goes to which polling station is again decided by a computer program, not manually. But there are certain rules saying that you can't get posted to the same taluka, you can't get posted to the same circle, you can definitely not get posted to your own where you are you are a uh, you are a resident. But despite all this, along with that, there is a computer program which decides who will be posted there. So that much a precaution is taken. Okay. So the talk, of course. Machines being machines, they might fail. It is, it is uh, natural. But you know what is the failure rate is? Failure rate of the electronic voting machine is below 0.05%. Below 0.5%. 0.5% below that. But the VDPAT is a mechanical device. So it tends to fail a little more like any mechanical device. That failure is between 1.2 1 to 1.2% 1 below that. It's not exceeded that. Initially, there were some problems when they were first introduced in UP in 2017. There was much bigger failure because the sensors on the uh, VVPAT were, um, were, were became faulty because of very high heat in UP. So they were modified, etc. Now there is the failure again. There is below 1% or so. But being a mechanical device, it fails a little more. So the talk of um, uh, EVM being manipulated is all, uh, to say the least, is nonsense. We'll take the last two questions. Good afternoon, sir. My question is, with the construction of the new parliament uh, and the number of members in both the houses being increased, how is this world? But that's why I, that's why I <laughs> deliberately said that. Uh, so my question is, with respect to the election commission, so how is this going to affect them? Is it going to ease their job or is it going to like put like more complex? See, if you can conduct election for 500 people, you can conduct it for 700 people. There is no difficulty at all. Only thing is, you and I will face the burden of having to uh, pay the salaries and allowances, etc., etc., of uh, 250 additional members of parliament. Uh, online elections can actually increase urban participation and it can be verified through OTP. So, why hasn't it been done anyway? Okay, okay. So, now let me ask a question to you. Hmm? <laughs> how, how much time does it take for you to go to the polling station once in five years or twice in five years, once to the assembly, once to the parliament, and uh, take part in physical voting. How much time does it take? Half an hour? Okay. 
45 minutes. So 45 plus 45, one and a half hours. And you spend one and a half hours for the welfare of your country once in five years. Is it that difficult? That you should wait for the... The other aspect is that come to why it is not going to happen. You know, uh, technology is only one issue. Even when persons come to the polling station and vote, you have to have a card, it is verified, and the political candidate's representative is sitting there, they will be satisfied that you are the right person who is coming. This is a photograph on the electoral law. Mind you, this is the reason why the photograph was brought on the electoral law in 2009. 2009 parliament election was the first election in which photographs were brought on the electoral law. You have a card, you have a photograph of the thing, it is compared and you are allowed to vote. Imagine a political party who doesn't even see you, who doesn't even know whether you are voting or your uh, brother is voting or your sister is voting or your servant is voting, allow you to vote. Never happen. Because seeing is believing for them. Even after seeing, they don't believe. When the, elect, uh, when the election results come, when they know the machine is not being uh, manipulated, even then they will say that, you know, I lost because of the machine. Yeah. Even seeing is not believing for them. Non-seeing is not going to be believed by them at all. So, they will never agree to an electronic uh, voting from a remote location. This time, because of the COVID, experiment was made where for above 80, the uh, postal facility was given by being allowed to vote at home. Even that was protested against. But the number was small. So, it, it still was a, uh, was a smaller number because people agreed for that because of the COVID etc. Otherwise, political parties will not accept because they don't know who is voting. For them, that is very essential. So, it is not the technology issue which is which is important here. What is important is the political parties that buy that story. I now request Dr. Vyasar Murthy to deliver his closing remarks on this enlightening lecture. Sir, you have covered a wonderful array of issues ranging from criminalization of uh, politics to um, inner party democracy and many other pertinent issues. And you have sparked a uh, lot of uh, interest among the students and faculty members and given many ideas to our Center for Election Studies and Democracy in India. And we are deeply thankful to you, sir, and uh, for accepting our invite and uh, 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 delivering the uh, distinguished public lecture of the organized by the Center for uh, Election Studies. And uh, um, the one man, one vote, uh, regardless of literacy levels, is a very lofty idea. But in practice, uh, the money power and muscle power always come in the way and many uh, reforms are happening and the Supreme Court judgments and other uh, laws are happening but uh, the enforcement at the ground level uh, is a, uh, leaves a lot to be desired and uh, uh, our students are now um, really excited and they will uh, start working on some of these issues and engaging with some of these issues uh, supervised by faculty. So thank you very much for uh, visiting our campus and inspiring our students. Thank you. How many of you are uh, involved in blood donation? Do you donate blood? Good. This is one thing every human being can do and nobody else can. So my appeal to all of you is to consciously, you can donate every three months, no problem. Even if you think that uh, three months is too little time, make it four months. I used to be a very regular donor. I received uh, you know, certificates of honor from many of the, uh, wherever I am, I vote. And I will tell you where I started, that is important, more than my community. 1965 war, I was uh, in Delhi preparing for the IAB time. Many, uh, many of our soldiers were injured and they were admitted to Ames and Ames was collecting blood. Believe me, I stood in the queue for four hours before I put the uh, 
since that time I have been a regular donor and I will appeal to all of you that this is something which every one of you can do. Please do that. Thank you.